Thank you so much. And whatever you were doing before, thank you for stopping that and doing this. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. So why? We've got to why. P-R-A-Y. Ourselves now. And this is for us, the word of God. And uh, may God bless us as we listen to his word. If I was to ask you what is the simplest thing that is the hardest to do in the Christian life, I suspect that some of you would work out that I was going to say praying. It is the simplest thing to do, and often it's the hardest thing to do as well. Probably the three most purchased books in the whole world are those that speak about bringing up children, healing, why God does and why God doesn't, and prayer. Well, today we're focusing on a very short phrase, pray continually, or in another version, never stop praying. Speaking with God. Isn't that incredible that the gift of prayer to us allows us to speak to the creator of the whole universe? God Almighty. I'm reminded that when C.H. Spurgeon, a famous pastor, uh, was asked, what is the secret of your preaching? He showed the questioner to a room behind the scenes in his church. And in that room were a group of people who were praying for his preaching. Billy Graham was asked similarly, what is the secret of your ministry? He answered by saying three things, prayer, prayer, prayer. R.T. Kendall notes that the God who ordained the end also ordained the means to the end, which we find worked out in Luke's account of that perfect prayer of Jesus in Luke 11, 9 to 11. <clears throat> where he includes some well-known, well-known verses which say, ask and go on asking, and it will be given you. Seek and go on seeking, and you will find. Knock and go on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks and goes on asking receives. Everyone who seeks and goes on seeking will find. Everyone who knocks and goes on knocking, the door will be open to them. Sir Winston Churchill was asked to give a speech at his old school, Harrow. Uh, he arrived late because of traffic issues. And so the whole of his great big long address, and he was quite used to doing long speeches, was condensed to 11 words. And these are the 11 words. He stood up, he went to the microphone, and he addressed his, the, the students by saying, never give in. Never, ever give in. Never, never give in. And then he sat down, and that was the end of his speech. So prayer, 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 and never give in, just about sums up the conclusion of this present teaching series on the words being. Do you remember, I had the privilege of starting this series at the uh, beginning of, of May, or back at the end of May. It was be devoted, be together, be obedient, be prepared, be relevant, be studious, be missional, and today, be prayerful. I don't know if you have read Solomon's prayer in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 uh, recently. I hadn't done so until I was preparing this talk earlier this week, but I was challenged by some of the verses. They go, when I shut up the, the heavens, this is God speaking, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land <clears throat> or send a plague among my people, 
if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The Christian author Eugene Peterson wrote a book, or it's a classic, about 20 years or so ago now, and it's, it's got an amazing title. It, the title is A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. That's a unique title, isn't it? A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. As a society, we are no less obsessed with the immediate than when Eugene Peterson wrote, first wrote his book, if anything, emails, the internet, and uh, social uh, um, situations on, on, uh, on computer uh, have intensified our quest for a quick fix. But Peterson's long time-tested prescription for uh, answering God answering our prayers and for discipleship remains exactly the same, a long obedience in the same direction. In the Song of Ascent between Psalms 120 and 134, he finds encouragement, he's, that's why he's written his book, for modern pilgrims, us, as we learn to grow in worship, in prayer, in service and joy and work, in happiness and humility, in community and blessing. What a wonderful description of pray continuously a long obedience in the same direction. When the disciples of Jesus wanted to mimic the way he was praying, because it was obvious how essential prayer was to the whole of Jesus' way of life, he taught them the prayer that we, I think, misguidedly call the Lord's Prayer, and probably ought to be called the Disciples' Prayer, and it's sometimes called the Perfect Prayer. You know how it goes. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The disciples had also witnessed the fact that within the context of spiritual warfare, I've spoken on spiritual warfare to you before, and I rather rudely exclaim to you that spiritual warfare is not about fighting each other at church members meetings. It's actually about dealing with the works of the evil one, who is our time-honoured enemy. In other words, the disciples saw that you have to battle and confront spiritual and societal ills. And Jesus explained that sometimes, quote, this type cannot come out except by prayer and fasting. So there are times when our spiritual warfare is not just about putting on the armour of God. It's not just mentioning a few quick things and asking God to sort it out. Sometimes we have to really go deeper in our prayer and even to fast. The enemy of our souls, the enemy of our souls needs the power of God to overcome his fiendish ways. In Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 18, we're clearly and firmly told to put on the whole armour of God in order to be equipped to deal with the enemy opposition. And it's done by praying and putting on the breastplate of righteousness, the, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the belt of truth, taking up a shield of faith, putting on the helmet of salvation, taking up, quickly Stu, the sword of the spirit, the word of God, and then it goes on to say, and pray in the spirit in all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. You see, 
our enemy, Satan, does not fear those who know how to pray. Please be understanding that. He doesn't, he's not afraid of you because you pray. He's afraid, afraid of those who know how to pray and do it. And do it. And do it for Jesus. Again, such is the enormity of the gospel task to preach the gospel to all people groups throughout the world prior to Jesus' return, that Jesus prompted and promoted his disciples to pray. And this is how he did it. He said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers into the harvest field. In other words, to pray. So as we get near the conclusion of this whole series and the conclusion of today's sermon, <clears throat> let me share some closing remarks, and they are just that. Firstly, true prayer involves trusting God enough to tell him what we really think and loving God enough to know that his presence is all we really need. Second, it's acceptable to express emotion to God when we talk to him. Sometimes the situation or situations that we are facing breeds within us such anger, such frustration, such insolence, such passion, such grief, such impatience, such irritation with God that we may be tempted to withhold from God our feelings in case he gets upset with us and won't have anything more to do with us. That's nonsense. When we do this, we're being less than we really are. Honesty, however brutal towards God, is not going to shock him. He's not going to sit there going, oh, oh, how could you say such terrible things? He doesn't work that way. What he requires of us to tell us, tell him like it really is, and he will absorb our emotions. That's important. The third thing to say, it's also acceptable to remain silent when you're praying. Have you ever done that? To listen instead of filling the silence with words or music or distractions. We know the phrase, be still and know that I am God. I personally find being still and being silent incredibly difficult. That's one of the hard things for me in prayer. I'd rather fill the space with words. I'm not so good at listening. And yet prayer is not meant to be a, a monologue, but a dialogue. God speaking to us, us speaking to God. Michael Card has written a rather challenging song. Well, certainly the title is challenging. And the title is simply, Will You Not Listen? And his whole song is about us not listening when we should be to God. And then just to balance that out. And I listened to that song earlier on this morning, just to balance that out. I listened to another song by Keith and Christine Getty that says, Holy Spirit, breath of God. And it was a lovely song of gentleness, just to uh, 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 be the opposite of Michael Card's song. If you want to pray and have set time aside to do it properly, and by that I simply mean without squeezing in a few words on your way to doing a few other things, and then find yourself struggling with, well, what shall I pray? I know I ought to, well, we can use songs, we can use psalms, books of prayers, your own written prayers. You can focus on objects and pictures that inspire you. You could light a candle, you can lie on the floor, you can lift your hands to heaven or hold out your hands in surrender and re in readiness to be given something. You could use a newspaper, the weekly notices sheet, the church directory. Uh, your family's names, uh, your neighbours' names and faces, your MP, your ward councillors, your schools and hospital and surgeries, 
your workplace colleagues don't they need prayers they've got to work with you and you've got to work with them uh, missionaries that you know do you know i typed into google these words what should i pray for and the first article that sprung up on the computer was entitled 21 things to pray for tips for a better prayer life in 2021 and i thought wow i'm overwhelmed already i've got 21 things i was only asking for one or two lastly there are two examples of people who were praying in the Bible, one of whom got, got it right and one who got it wrong. I'm going to start with the negative first. You see, when Moses was leading the family of God through the desert wilderness towards the promised land, there came a time when the people of God got very angry because they were thirsty. There was no water for them or their herds or their families, and they came and, and bashed at, at, at Moses, as it were, metaphorically, and said, we want water. And Moses went to God and prayed. And God said, see that rock over there, take your walking staff and hit the rock and water will come out. And so Moses did that. A little bit later on, there was another very same experience where the people of God ran out of water. They got very angry with Moses and they said, give us water. We're so thirsty for our flocks, herds and our families. And Moses got irritated. Have you ever been irritated by people asking the same thing? I bet you never have. Not. But if you ever have, Moses got like that. And he just took his staff, went over to a rock and bashed it. But God had said to him, speak to the rock. But he just took his stick and, well, while well, it worked last time, I'll bash it again and see what happens. And water came out. But God reprimanded Moses very severely. That was one situation. The last situation to share you is, is when David was being attacked. Um, by the armies of the Philistines. His whole nation was under attack. And David went to God, just like Moses had, and asked him, well, what should I do? Should I just go and attack them back? The best form of defence being attack. And God said, yes, that's a brilliant idea, do it. So he went and did that, and, and he, he won the battle. And then a little bit later on, the Philistines came back for a second go at it. And uh, David asked God again, what should I do? Should I just go and, and attack them? And God said, no, 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 no. I want you to outflank them and only attack when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of some balsam trees. What? So David did just that. He sent his armies round to flank the Philistines and then they waited until they heard the sound well it wasn't the sound of marching because they were all still it was the sound of god's armies marching through the tops of the balsam trees how can you ever understand that none of us can but because he waited and did what god told him the second time he was able again to win a battle and i learn from these things as i come to my closing sentences i learned this in prayer, however important it is to keep praying, we must never presume that what God answered previously, he will necessarily answer in exactly the same way the next time we have to pray. Presumption does not accompany prayer. God doesn't do presumption. That's why the Bible teaches it is so necessary for us to do this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding or presumption, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. So the Bible teaches, last sentence, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Amen. I want to say this sentence 
but of two sentences that I gleaned from somewhere as our response. Spirit of God, make us open to others in listening, generous to others in giving, and sensitive to others in praying. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>